Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, so uh, the, the the talk is very challenging as uh, the, 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 the topic of the, the workshop. And in fact, I did a, a similar discussion without knowing actually that the topic would have been this at this workshop a few weeks ago in another meeting to try to see what are the what is the balance between uh, risks and advantages of deep learning and machine learning and things thing like that. So I think that the truth, of course, is is never on one side or the other, but it's probably in the middle. And what I will try to show is that, uh, uh, in spite of the fact that I'm, you know, sort of an elderly guy who likes models and things like that, there are also there is also room for uh, machine learning methods that turns out to be quite fast, quite efficient, and in certain cases, really the only way to to go around. And now we'll do it in the context of a project that was funded. Uh, already more than five years ago on the uh, by the European Union. And that allowed me to develop uh, together with uh, a whole bunch of students. And of course I will present uh, their work, uh, develop a, a number of, of uh, interesting solutions that, that uh, use this uh, uh, deep learning technology to address very specific uh, problems. So I give you the, 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 the end of the, of the talk uh, at the beginning. So basically I think that uh, if we are in the small neural networks are very good you can really learn specific small things but if you are in the large uh long term long uh, large number of parameters uh, large experiments so forth, then they show a lot of limitation but i'll try to to justify what i'm saying with with my presentation so let's move forward and if i can Okay, so this is the, the, the project that will be working. And you see the a topic is uh, uh, develop the technologies for autonomy in robotic surgery. So you will only see uh, sort of proof of concept, uh, prototypes and not uh, something as, as, uh, as realistic as uh, Julian showed, because we are, uh, we are very far from that. Uh, we are doing also some uh, closer thing, but that the, uh, I didn't present it, we will talk about perhaps later. And basically the, what we wanted to show, if, if the screen shows it, is basically to try to uh, instantiate some of this uh, classification that was presented uh, a few years ago by a number of people on uh, robotic science uh, led by uh, Guanzong Yang. And uh, of course, it's a very coarse classification, is a sort of unrealistic, uh, but it gives you some sort of ladder, increasing ladder in difficulty. And I will show you where in, in, you know, we can use, uh, uh, where we have developed technology for the different, uh, different parts. Uh, th this uh, concept of autonomy goes under the umbrella of cognitive robotics. Cognitive robotics is uh, when you put intelligence in this uh, <clears throat> field of research. And it was uh, started, uh, the word was first proposed uh, some uh, 20 years ago in, uh, in Germany, a workshop at, uh, <clears throat> actually it was like 15 years ago at Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, at that time it was the University of Karlsruhe, when we start discussing how we can put intelligence in, in uh, especially in uh, medical and robot and surgical applications, which are really uh, somehow on, on the opposite side of, of what is needed for uh, efficiently learning something. I mean, there are very few cases, no pathology is the same, no autonomy, uh, anatomy is the same. So it's really, when, when you really want to do some learning, uh, it becomes a, a real problem. And uh, so basically to achieve this, we will need to, to address all the things. So basically the robot will have all, will have all the properties that uh, an intelligent system has and somehow <clears throat> he has to reach uh, autonomy. So basically, uh, in my opinion, cognitive robotics cannot go without a strong link with autonomy because uh, robots or, or algorithms in general, in general are getting very fast. Uh, there is no way that the uh, human uh, can interact or can respond in, in case of emergency fast enough to match the speed of the robot. So the robot has to react and to act autonomously uh, to be able to keep the safety, which is the paramount parameter, paramount object of our study. So, you know, this is a very brief justification why we need autonomy. And to study this, we developed this, uh, we, we proposed, and fortunately, the European uh, Union funded me with this very long and very large grant, uh, 
to develop this technology. And I did it, you know, these are the objectives, very engineering type kind of objectives. Uh, and you will see, you know, developed in, in work packages. And, uh, but, you know, fortunately this type of grant allows us a lot of flexibility. So this was a structure, we followed loosely the structure of, of the development of the project, but going in, in, in depth in certain areas, not, not giving this uh, complete uh, and, and, and uh, uniform uh, development. So we, we build the demonstrators, but really, uh, of course, we are still far away from achieving a, a real autonomous robot. The, six, the last point, the six points there, is actually uh, more on, on the social aspect or ethical aspect of uh, uh, this, this approach because um, autonomy is a very tricky subject, a la, generates a lot of, of uh, uh, questions, a lot of uh, doubts and, among people, and so we needed to be able to uh, address, prepare, and also uh, discuss the ethical and social implication of this, uh, uh, these new features of, of autonomy. Really in the medical field, we really have uh, no uh, difficulties. Uh, it's, you know, worldwide, the medical personnel is overworked. Uh, they they uh, wait uh, very, uh, they accept very happily to have technology that will reduce their workload uh, uh, unlike the, the, the industrial field where, you know, uh, the, the economy is such that, uh, you know, robots, if robots become uh, more powerful than they are right now, uh, they can actually replace workers and then creating a lot of social problems. In medicine, fortunately, this doesn't happen. So we have, uh, uh, we don't have social barriers. We have people who are eagerly waiting for new solutions and are helping us. And so it, we, we are in a very, uh, very good position. But we need to discuss this, this problem because for instance, if you have uh, an autonomous system, how do you do an informed consent? How do you get uh, to explain to the patient what the robot will do? So there are a number of issues that we need to address. Okay. Okay, and as I said, that's the social and uh, ethical aspects of autonomous robots. All right, this is some sort of a loose description just to give you a, a framework of where we all the, the, the topics that we'll be discussing today will fit in. So we start with some sort of knowledge representation. I think the knowledge representation is the key to autonomy because the robot has to understand both what it does and what happens around it or, or to it. And so that is the, the key. A key point. Uh, then from this knowledge, there is a, a, a task uh, plan that is generated, and then the, the plan is executed through some robot. We use, uh, we have, uh, we're lucky that we have a, one of the uh, Da Vinci research kits. There are about 40 or 45 something in the world. Uh, one of them is, was, was given to us, which is a very credible, although a little bit shaky at this, at this moment, moment platform that uh, uh, speak the same language than, than, uh, than surgeons speak. So when the surgeon comes to see uh, our robot understands that this is a credible demonstration. However, there is a, a, an age gap here because the, the robot that we have is already a 20 year old robot and uh, younger generation are not able to use it. So that's uh, one of the, the reason there is a big uh, project worldwide led by John Hopkins uh, on, on uh, rejuvenating this uh, this research platform also to allow new generation to be more uh, to interact better with this robot younger surgeon who learn how to use a, a surgical robot with the uh, newer platform or even with the xi platform really are not able to use the old platform so there is a generation gap right there but you know that's okay uh the the platform that we, we use is this one here. That's the research uh, kit. And we, we, did the, we, we did the first demonstration, which is again a, tra a training task with, with a peg and ring uh, uh, exercise. And then now we're working on a, a second demonstration to be more clinically, more, uh, more surgical relevant. Uh, and I'll, see you, I'll show you the uh, examples, how we solved some of the problems related to this. Okay, so <laughs> where does 
partner does machine learning fits in all of this uh, the thing that we do and these are all the examples that i uh, will I will present one was already presented by d earlier on but you know we, we basically as i said no pathology is the same no tissue is the same especially when there is a pathological tissue really ha you have no model you can get some nominal model but then you know it's very far from reality so one issue is to try to learn it but learn it where you know the, the, since there is no data uh, another point that is very interesting is how to get uh, uh, to use the the wealth of information that is available you know i divided uh, the 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 sort of structure of knowledge into two parts the top-down type of knowledge extraction where you get it from textbooks from interviews from all the all the material that is available and then the bottom-up knowledge that you learn from data and i will talk about both things but you know knowledge from books is a typical top-down uh way of extracting knowledge and the surgical procedures are represented in, in algorithmic forms semi-algorithmic form and so one would think that it's easier in a sense to to map a procedures into a language or into a, co a computer robot procedure and we'll see that it's not really that simple uh, of course then we can use it to learn how to make uh, or to improve a task plan uh, then the example that he was showing uh, about grasping action but is a little bit more complex because it really uh, was also related to the structure uh, of the of the tissue that was uh, meant to be grasped uh, then there is another thing that is called the dynamic uh, uh, motion uh, primitives and so we can use uh, which can be learned by a very small uh, number of examples so you know we can plan actions by learning some coefficients or some uh, differential equations and then we can use it for uh, image processing which is somehow a standard approach and then uh, another thing that is working process uh, complementing analytical models which i think is one of the, the key application of neural networks what we do not know is right here oops uh, let's see okay we don't plan a task using uh, deep learning we don't plan a task using neural networks uh, we don't model complex behavior we don't model abstract concept it will, it will be a point where i'll tell you what abstract concept we i'm referring to so basically all things that are of broader scope we we use uh, uh, deep learning as some sort of virtual uh, virtual sensor artificial sensor that is able to as was uh, was shown in examples at the beginning complement something for instance when you talk about sub sensor substitution so means that uh, when you're doing a surgery the, the surgeon is able to uh, understand the the properties of the tissue by by analyzing the deflection of the tissue and and that of course takes years of training a, a virtual force sensor like the one one shown uh, uh, earlier uh, allows to and what is the, the 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 good thing of this allow to reduce the learning curve so basically like uh, every robotic or, or ai applications sort of are averaging the field so if you are a younger surgeon or you are an expert surgeon using this uh, technology particularly robotics allows you to have good performance even if you are a starting surgeon which is good or bad you know depends but you know especially like in in eye surgery it takes years to get the the the, the accuracy to to cannulate a vessel in the retina but if you're using a, a robotic support uh, then it's much easier and in fact we, i just lost one of my best phd students to to this field so anyway uh what we use in 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 the whole in the whole uh, structure of of this autonomy is simulation and we think simulation is some sort of of uh, consciousness of the robot like uh, ourselves we have a mental model of what we'll be doing and what is the mental model of the robot the simulation of the task uh, and so you know we start from some analysis of, of the word is of, of the uh, pathology the, the preoperative images and then we start adding a number of features here you know our a priori knowledge we generate a plan we verify the plan by simulation and then we execute the plan but of course 
reality is what is uh, what is always right you know reality is the truth the simulation is only a poor approximation and so basically we assume that there will be some sort of feedback and then we will return to modify the model modify the plan and so forth so this is some sort of philosophy that we have behind our development uh, trying to understand whether we can instantiate this sort of uh, closed loop feedback that allows us to it's called learning while doing which also has some implication for for practical things like uh, uh, certification of the machines and and uh, uh, being able to commercialize the devices because if you have a machine that changes its own parameters learns what to do while it's doing is not the same machine that was certified so it cannot be used uh, but these are these are uh, details that we are not uh, addressing here so how do we learn the model of the deformation again anatomy is is uh, very difficult very different from person to person so we started with this uh, discussion this is the work of of uh, uh, Eleonora Tagliabue, one of my PhD students, who just went to a famous German company that makes microscopes to work on eye surgery. And uh, so, you know, Julian, you will find her <laughs> in your field very soon. And uh, so we start doing a lot of, of simulation. This was for another project for um, biopsy of the breast. And we applied a, a, this, this uh, sort of U-shaped network to do the convolutions, to do the uh, processing. So basically, what are we trying to do? We, we input the deformation that we can get from the from the output. We get the forces out. So these are sort of uh, uh, virtual sensors that allows us to do you know where uh, what we are doing. And the the point is try to figure out. Uh, where the internal lesion moving when we deform an object. This is true for, for the breast, it's true for, for the prostate, for other organs. So basically, you have to, do, to deal with a, a non-uniform non -uniform, non -uniform, uh, elasticity of the tissue, uh, non-homogeneous, and basically by playing around with the different parameters, we uh, simulate how the internal lesion moves under pressure so we can be more accurate in terms of inserting the, the needle. Of course, we cannot have uh, that many uh, phantoms that we can play with. We don't, can, of course, use patients. So we do the uh, re uh, seem to real approach. So we have a very, very accurate but slow uh, but very precise uh, FEM model that models the uh, the anatomy or, or, the, or the tissue that we want to uh, simulate. We generate a number of training data. With the training data, we train a, a, a that the network, and we are able to to get the results. And here, you know, these are some of the results that we can get. And the advantage is because the uh, prediction is very fast once we are able to get the uh the network trained the way we, we are supposed to and of course there are ways to figure out when the training is is okay then the, the system is like a, a, a hardware sensor basically gives you an immediate response which is really what you want in in a real time kind of application so this is perfect to to get the simulation of the movement of the uh, of the target of a biopsy uh, regarding the example that he was showing, learning the uh, grasping point, which is here, it's there, it's right here. We are working. We were working with with a group of Sofa, uh, which is one of the few setups that include the FAM calculation, include simulation in these uh, programming frameworks, and. Uh, uh, and then we use Unity and to get the, the, the display, the visualization, we get uh, the library of NVIDIA to do the, the uh, faster physics computation. And so we were able to, to get very nice simulations, which I, I wish I could. So here, this of course is a, is, a, is a toy problem, but we are able to simulate both the rigid mechanics of the uh, Da Vinci and the flexible uh, object that we are manipulating. Of course, we have a lot of, uh, Octopuses in our laboratory floating around and, and having great uh, uh, fish dinner. Uh, but you know, this is a possibility, a one nice approach. And this is what uh, actually we use this for, this simulation. Here, the point is not only to show that the system can learn how to lift uh, 
<clears throat> they learn to learn how to lift a tissue and then eventually you know it does and uh, you will see that after some learning uh, we generate a, a proper policy to that the simulation and the real execution exactly match each other uh, but of course this is one of the few good examples out of hundreds of trials that were not that perfect uh, but the point was uh, what, not only that but you really wanted to figure out where to grasp it and where the tissue, this sort of, of uh, flappy uh, layer of fat there, was attached to the, to the other tissue. So the learning was not only just be able to find the grasping and lift it, but also to model the anatomy below. And there are a number of other uh, examples that I, I, we could discuss and show where you know, we lift uh, layers of tissue attaching different points and uh, the by by seeing where how it behaves in the lifting the the the, the system can learn where the attachment points are the attachment points are extremely important when you do some surgery because you really want to mobilize some tissue so really by probing in this way the tissue you figure out where there are the connection with the other organs with the connectivity and so forth and so then you you can uh, get information how to progress with your with your in uh, intervention this is uh, really the, the, the end uh, story of, of the work of Eleonora, which is uh, a, 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 an evolution of the, of the previous uh, diagram that I show you, where the simulated environment is really what allows us to have some sort of, of uh, sorry, the term consciousness of, of, the, of, the, of the robot. So the robot is aware of what, what to expect, what should happen and if it doesn't happen he knows that he has he made or he has a wrong data now pbm is patient specific biomechanical model which generates the simulation the simulation generates the expectation on the sensor like like we do you know we go around we expect to get some uh, something and if it doesn't happen uh, uh, you know we, we, we increase our attention and of course the sensor generate the uh, sort of a, a, a planning of action and expected sanctions then there is uh, expected sensing then there is a, of course the action that operates in the real environment but the action also goes into updating the simulation and so you have this real and sim they work in parallel and somehow they are compared of course unfortunately Eleonora left too early uh, fortunately for her because she got a fantastic job but uh, you know we're still working on figuring out how we compare these two because these are multi-dimensional multi um, relationship type of, of things that are not particularly easy to to deal with and of course you see uh, there is also some learning here that uh, in theory we should be able to learn uh, while doing so you know the the error generated by the differences between the real environment and the simulator environment could promote some additional learning in terms of changing the biomechanical model because of course the, the tissue properties are different from uh, what we started with nominal properties or the environment has as uh, uh, created some unexpected situation, so we have to replan. So th that's, that's uh, where we are right now in this part. But you know, there is a, a, a room, both in terms of a point type solutions of very specific things during the execution and the overall structure where you can actually learn to address. But again, we are not learning the whole task. We are learning how to change some part of a given task. In our approach, we don't, uh, we have a sort of sort of easy way to do the planning. We are really not planning uh, from scratch. We have a, a, a given procedure and we adapt the procedure to a current anatomy. So our planning is basically some adaptation of, of a given a given sequence of action. So it's not really, so we don't deal with, deal with the uh, combinatorial explosion that you have when you do task planning. This is another thing that we never expected to, to, to find, but it turns out that is that has generated a lot of interest in, in the surgical community. This is the work of Marco Bombieri, who is another of my PhD student. And uh, uh, you know, we really wanted to have a, a continuous flow from the 
contextual uh, historic information into the execution of the robot. So basically, we said, oh, but this is trivial. You have, uh, we have very nice uh, textbooks on robotic procedures. It's written, uh, you do this, you, you, if, you, if you achieve this goal, you do this other. It's basically a computer program. Let's, let's translate it. Oh, well, it turns not, out not to be the simple, first of all, because the, the sentences are not uniform. Uh, you need to get a lot of, of uh, uh, competences in, in language understanding, natural language processing, uh, structure of the sentences, because uh, another of my PhD student, uh, Camilla Fiazza, she's working on understanding, she's working from the point of view of safety, but uh, for instance, the, 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 the ad ad adverb along has like five or six meanings, each one different, and she's working with different surgeons and every specialty of surgery understands the meaning of along in a different way. So in, in, really, in order to have a, a unique representation of what a textual procedure means, it takes a lot of work. But then once you, you move forward, you need to extract, and this is the overall image of what we are doing. So basically extract the sentences that refer to actions, because it turns out that there are a lot of sentences that refer to you know, site conditions and, and uh, uh, constraints and so forth, but really not the real action. So you have to do some textual analysis, figure out what are the verbs, what are the subjects. Sometimes the verb is in passive mode, so you have to invert it. So it's, it's again, not really easy. Uh, you can do it by hand, but of course we want to do it automatically. So, and to, to get a result like this, you know, so this is a, 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 a small sentence that you see here, the section can be performed without cautery and there is a clip and so on. This is the type of sentence you find in a textual, in a surgery textbooks. And you need to identify all the points that are related to the action. And this is, can be done automatically. And uh, we use all tools, model tools that are called BERT. BERT is, uh, I don't remember what the acronym is, but is a, is a a big language processing, it has like 46 million parameters and uh, allows to identify <laughs> once it's trained, uh, well, it's already trained, sorry, you, you give it the, the, the sentence you want to, to analyze and it gives you what is the subject, what is the verb, what are the different things. The problem is, and this is one of the problem of machine learning, that these huge data sets are based on national language, common national language, not surgical language. So, which is completely different. Uh, meaning of words, meaning of verbs, tip, type of words, they are different. So we created another uh, data set, which is surgical BERT, that uh, allow, uh, allow to somehow um, improve the, the, the recognition capability. And we created a, a, a data set to train this, uh, this uh, recognition system on a sentence that's specific to robot assisted surgery. So we created a data set, we start learning and we are in the process of, of, of developing an automatic process procedure to get to uh, you know, this, this step, done this step all uh, automatically. But you see here, you know, we have a um, sort of a <coughs> common language or in a normal language, when you do it on a, on a medical uh, point of view, uh, BERT does, by itself doesn't work. There is something, I don't remember, it's clinical surgical BERT that is specialized for, uh, for medical applications, but again, is not specific to robot assisted. So that's why we needed to retrain. So we started with a given machine learning, we retrained and we got it. So again, this is another application that was unexpected. Why is it generating interest in the, in the surgical world on the surgeons? Because it, it, it set the foundation for a general language for robot assisted surgery. There will be soon more than one uh, surgical robot, hopefully. You know, Medtronics, uh, Cambridge Medical, Johnson & Johnson. Altogether, there are 72 companies working on, on the surgical robots and each one will be different. Right, so how do we get, this is a common problem in, in robotics. How do we get a robotic embodiment to do the same task? And how do we specify a, a task which is the same with different, to different robotic embodiments? And so this 
capability of, of generating a uniform or unified or, or sort of a common language for, for robot surgery could help in this direction. We will have some sort of uh, P based, there was a language that was many centuries ago, it was uh, sort of was allowed to interpret a, a different language, get a common language, then was specialized to the different architecture. And this probably is something similar that will allow to, to uh, make the translation between different robotic embodiments. But this doesn't uh, give you the key points of the, uh, of the, of the procedure. So this, you remember, we, we are talking about uh, action. So we are able to extract what the robot should do, but how does the robot move from one part to the other, from one action to the other? What are the logical conditions, the precondition, the post-condition that allow the robot to move forward? And so right now we are doing it by hand, honestly, uh, but working on that. So we are using another approach, which again is, is not fashionable these days, is logic programming. We, have, we are using something that's called answer set programming, ASP, because it's understandable. Uh, you know, we is, is uh, again, this is the work of another of my PhD student, Daniele Meli, who's now working in, in my department as uh, uh, assistant professors. And you see, uh, these are the action that we want to describe, that we want to execute, and we can represent them in, in uh, 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 logic formalism. I don't say that this is immediately understandable by a, a, a known uh, computer science, but it can easily translate it into a natural language. So we can actually facilitate the communication. And of course, we, we do it by hand. Where is the machine learning enters here? It, answer, it answer, enters at this point where it can actually improve it by inductive logic, inductive learning, ILP, inductive logic programming. Uh, and basically, we have again also in this case, uh, seem to real. We generate by hand all the conditions that that uh, trigger the different actions in a task, and then using ELP, we can improve this setup. So we can learn a better sequence of logic conditions. We can combine them. We can or reduce them. Optimize in a sense the the the. Uh, the description and the connect connectivity between one action and the other. And so, okay. Now, this basically is all the top-down part that I've described. Remember, they want to divide the knowledge acquisition between top-down and bottom-up. Top-down, somehow manage, we understand what they are. Bottom-up is, is really tricky. And uh, because we, we have data which are sort of very dirty in, in uh, our dear friend uh, in AI, I'm in a computer science department. So I have all this big discussion with my colleagues for whom you know, the data are logic transitions. They are uh, crisp uh, logical statements, but real data are not like that. They're very messy. So what do you do with that? You, know, you, you have to do a lot of processing. And in particular, if you want to learn the structure of, the, of a complete procedure, at least uh, have the robot been able to understand what's going on, what is the uh, surgeon doing? So being able to segment all the time series of data, being able to recognize a phase into a uh, phase of, of an intervention, you have to generate a model of this. Again, and this is just an analytical model, and we have two of them. It's a hybrid automaton. We have different uh, discrete states, and we have continuous states. And uh, this is just to show that you know there is room for models, but I don't go into the details of this. But this instead is what I was talking about, the dynamic mo motion primitives, which are actually learned with, with uh, a very simple, just a couple of examples that I will show you in a moment, you can learn the parameters of the differential equations. And so you can learn how to duplicate a motion that is presented to our system. So basically once you duplicate this motion, you can uh, do whatever you want. And, and what I'm saying is what I refer to is, is, the, is the following. You see here, there are two motions. One is uh, uh, taught to the system using a, a, a Panda or Frank Amica robot, and the other is executed by the Da Vinci. And you, you look at the, at the two uh, shapes, they are qualitatively the same, sort of the more or less, more or less with the same shape, but you know, there is a factor of scale, sc scale factor here. This is the, the blue is the Panda and the orange is the Da Vinci system. 
and uh, uh, we can manipulate these trajectories, which is not very easy when you when you have a trajectory, you have uh, a computer program or a plan and so forth. With this approach, representing the motion, the continuous motion with differential equations, we can actually have this. And here you see, we, we teach the motions with very simple motion with the panda, and then they're duplicated with the da Vinci. So the scale factor really is, is exceptional. And putting all these things together, we got this first uh, uh, demonstration that was actually a year and a half ago. And again, these are the, the program that we write in, in ASP, so in logic um, statements. And the, the system is able to recognize the environment. So there is a lot of situation awareness, uh, sensing, but these are just algorithms. They're not machine learning, so I didn't uh, go into, didn't describe them, but is able to react to different situations. You know, here is able to control a bimanual execution. Uh, again, these are the different logic statements in the uh, in this ASP program that uh, once in a while they're coming out. Now there is a new event happening. The the sensing system recognizes there is a a new ring and and it, it uh, picks it up and and deposits. So we are able to generate all these tasks, and, and this actually is a very robust execution. We did a number of tests, and this works quite well. And so you know, it's not as critical as putting a needle into an eye. But, you know, at least we got we got these results. The classical application of machine learning, segmenting images. This is another uh, we call it ProsNet because we need to um, <clears throat> automatically segment uh, the, the borders of the prostate, both in in preoperative and intraoperative uh, uh, intraoperative being a biopsy setting. So we have this net that does the, the result. And these are the, the results. Some are okay, some are not okay. But here we need to be very careful about the generalization because we, we tested the, the, the system with, uh, uh, we tried to have a single net that was able also to, to learn uh, both the, the um, contour of the prostate and some of the critical points of the tumor. But the, the, the system generalized and then sometimes it segments only half of the prostate. And so again, the bias in the, in the data set is very critical. And we thought we were smarter because with a single net, we could do everything. In reality, the net sort of averaged the different size of the element that we wanted to do. And it, it didn't, 90% uh, of the cases, it did the right uh, answer. But in some cases, it just merged and they get a completely wrong segmentation. So, you know, we have to be careful and it was surprising. And finally, the last thing, just to make our the chairperson content, happy. Uh, this is work in progress. Uh, we are dealing with the old Da Vinci, which has a lot of problems. Uh, so we, we, in, in a robotic uh, surgery, you cannot put sensor or you, you, we are not being able to put sensor in the instrument right now. So of course you try to get the uh, a substitute for the sensors. Basically try to get a model that allows you to avoid the sensing up here. You can use the, the, the forces of the motors, okay? But these are, you know, very, very bad. Sometimes uh, you get uh, spikes that are not, sometimes uh, the, the complete, not completely out of, of uh, connection with the real data. You see, these are the measures. So basically these are the motors and then the predicted effort, which are the dynamic model. And so we are trying then, you know, terrible spikes that we don't understand what, what they are. So basically we are trying to create a system that combines the analytical model and a, a machine learning device that compensate the non-linearities that are not available, that cannot be modeled or are not modeled in the analytical model. We are working on this. Again, these are uh, examples of classifiers. We are improving something. You see that the, 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 the graphs are a little bit better, but still you know, sort of a misunderstanding of, of these data that we are not understanding. And finally, just to, to uh, talk about abstract concept, what is the dark matter of knowledge? Something that uh, nobody is addressing in robotic surgery right now, and is common sense reasoning. When you talk about uh, uh, surgery, what we have seen right now is basically just this little part up there. When you talk to a surgeon, they all tell you, oh yeah, but 
the textbook is fine, but then you need common sense everywhere. So in common sense, I couldn't find the reference to give you, but there is a guy, I don't remember whether it's Facebook or some of this uh, strange outfit, that is trying to model to have a neural network with the several trillion parameters to model all the human common sense. Forget about it. We, we are, are trying to, to do something that you know, limits or sort of partitions the common sense in different areas. And we have the working hypothesis that depending on the level of autonomy, you need more and more common sense. But again, this is, uh, we, we just come up with these ideas a few weeks ago and we are trying to see whether it makes sense or not. So just to conclude and make everybody happy. So machine learning is, uh, has a definitive role. There are a number of things that we cannot really model, that we cannot really know beforehand. We can learn it, but we have to be very careful. We can be careful both on the application that we want to use and on the training data. And because this is where you know you, you drive your system and uh, you cannot avoid sometimes bias, but you have to be aware of that and be ready to adjust for that. And this is concludes my talk. And uh, this is some of the, the people that have been working on, on this. Thank you very much. Thanks our speaker, thanks so much. Since we don't have, don't have time, sorry, we are like more than a little bit behind the schedule. So with that, I wanted to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Emmanuel van der Porten, please have the stage. Thank you. So we need to reschedule a little bit after this talk. So most probably for the poster pitch session, we are going to have a very quick session and coffee break. Unfortunately, we need to cut it to five minutes. Sorry for the 